So why don't we just go ahead and get started? As we do, let's create a graph and we're going to run this guy from basics. It's like we've done all the other ones. We're going to start with sand. So let's put down some a basic NPM sand graph. So just like everything else, it's a compound with no inputs and outputs. So to get at those inputs and outputs, we hit explode. And you will immediately see the similarities here as per the PowerPoint. There's your source, your collider, your solver settings, your simulation engine, and this one pops a, pops a material on there for you as well. So it's a surface material. If you ignore these two, it's exactly the same as pretty much every single simulation system we've looked at already, with the exception of combustion, which just has extra nodes. But that's all right, because this has extra nodes too. Let's get started and make some sand. So the first thing we're going to do is make a cube. Cubes being a nice sort of solid shape there, quite, quite happily. Let's get a terminal going so we can see what we're doing as we're making things. This is going to become, as, as per the other videos, this is going to become the source for our sand. So let's get that, say, uh, I don't know, something like 10 long, one wide, one high. Yeah, that's going to be fine. And what we'll do is we'll hook that straight up to the source. So we're sourcing our sand. Time to have a look at some of these options for NPM sand. These you should be familiar with. Start frame, end frame, and the numbers. The distribution mode is how you want to distribute the sand on the object you're sourcing it from. So when it's a volume, it will distribute the sand throughout that cube. But if it was just surface, it would distribute the sand across the surface of that cube. And then we're just going to come down here and so that's the distribution mode. And then we've got display scale. So how big each particle is. It doesn't affect the simulation. It's just a display of how big each particle is. So we'll set that to 0 0.2 and particles per voxel. So you remember we talked about this is at the very beginning. We talked about a material point and a voxel grid. This is the number of particles you want to generate per voxel in your voxel grid. The higher that number, the slower it's going to be. So we'll start with about 20 to start with. Then we've got the geometry volume conversion, which allows you to convert this geometry to a volume to, to distribute points into. So that's all of those settings again. And again, detail size here. When this is off, this will control it. When this is on, we need to come down to the solver here and this becomes our master detail size right here. It's the size of the voxels that we're scattering into. So if we've got 20 points per voxel and our voxel is tiny, we're going to have an awful lot of points to fill this space in the world. However, if our voxel's not too bad, say 0.15 is pretty good, it's quite a chunky little voxel there, then 20 points inside that isn't really going to hurt us all that much. We are going to go through more of the settings as we go along, but let's move on for now. So we're going to start building the colliders and to do that we need a collider. So I'm going to just import a file that I'm, I, will, I will give to you. And this will become our collider. We're just going to hide it because we're not going to use it just now, but we are going to drop it into the, into the Bifrost. And what we're going to need to do here, what we want to do is make sand fall off these guys, fall out of this guy, and then hit these guys. So rather than just having one, which is kind of boring, let's, let's scatter some. I think you can probably see what's coming. So let's make a plane. Let's make that plane's up axis the x axis. Let's throw this into the terminal so we can see what's going on. You won't see it just yet. We want it to be the same width as this guy. So, or the same length as this guy. So the easiest way to do that is just drop this out and this one. Maybe not that one. And then we can plug that straight into our length here. And then let's make our width 5. So we've got our plane. There we go. We're just going to use this to position our colliders. So why don't we why don't we just drop that a little bit so that it's sitting underneath. And I'll just get rid of the grid for now. So now we have that's the Bifrost. Now in our, we have our cube here, which is going to be our particle emitter. And we have our plane, which doesn't need that many depth segments in it. We have our plane that's going to hold our colliders. So let's get that built. 
So first thing I'm going to do is scatter on these. I'm going to set the scatter to blue noise. And let's throw down the point scope. Just so we can see what we're doing as we do it. Let's change that to color. Let's make that color yellow. Let's make that about 0 0.1. Let's just plug this into our terminal as well. You can see how we're working with the terminal. And there's our points. Now we've scattered way too many points right now. We don't want that many points. We want maybe about 25. Maybe about 25 of these. So as I'm pretty sure you can work out what's going to come now, we'll do this real fast as well. We need our star that we made, that we brought in. And then that guy can just go straight out to the terminal. And we've got some stars there now. They're all a bit big. That's alright, we know how to, how to change that. Just randomize the point scale. Yeah, looking something like that maybe. The seed, a little bit of a tweak. Something we like the look of. That's cool. And now the, the last thing we really want to do, it'd be kind of nice if we could rotate these guys. You know what I mean? So have them spinning as the sand hits them. That way we can get some sort of effect. And we kind of know how to do that too. So let's, before we do that, let's throw down some rotate random rotation. Just going to randomize our rotation a bit. And that's looking pretty good. If you can change the seed, you can see that they're spinning in various directions, which is pretty nice. That, that's pretty much good as it is. Now we really just have to make a little system so that they continually rotate, which is fairly easy as well. So if we want something to continually rotate, then we're going to need a time node. Is our time node. It's probably, let's give ourselves, I don't know if it's going to be too fast, but let's give ourselves the ability to slow it down or speed it up as we need to. I'm just going to turn that just to 0 0.2 for now, because I found that that works quite well when we're doing this kind of thing with the, with the time node. I'm just going to throw that throw a value down. And I'm just going to basically use this to generate rotations. So that was wrong. So we change our value to a vector, 3. Plug that into the Y. We're going to use a little compound called Euler to Quaternion. And if that, aren't, that isn't the two hardest words to say when you're making a video, I don't know what is. So what this will do is take this value and convert it to a quaternion for us. And then all we have to do now is transform the points. Of course, for that, we need a matrix. So we just SRTTM, SRT to matrix, quaternion goes to quaternion, transform goes to transform. And then we just replace our output here with that. And if we now press play, now there's a problem. They're rotating, but they're rotating on the wrong axis. We need to plug that. Not in there. <laughs> we need to plug that into the X. Because remember when we set up our plane, all the way back here, our X axis was our up axis. So these, these two have to match. So that's X and X. And now if we do this, now there's a problem again. We need them to rotate separately. Not as, not as one big unit. So for that, I think I might use rotate points instead. Pop that into there. Pop that guy in there. Now this makes it even easier. We really just need to tell it what axis we're rotating on, and we already have that. We have that here in our mesh plane. So if we go to our transform, make a value out of our up axis, like this, and then plug the up axis into our axis. And at this point, we just have to get radians. Animated radians, so radians that always climb. So rather than doing it the way we did before, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a compound called tau which is equivalent to 2 pi. Going to divide. We're going to divide tau by a number. And that number is 
how far around the circle you want to go every time it ticks over a frame. So let's just put in a value. This is just another way to do it. So I'm going to say I want to divide tail by 32. Actually, why not 36? Pop that in there. And then it's just a matter of multiplying this, the amount you're going to displace per frame, the amount you're going to rotate per frame, with this, which is the number for your frames, and you can plug that straight into your radians. You see they moved a little bit, and now they're rotating. So now we have rotation with a speed control, which is exactly what we wanted. So enough of this messing about. We've just made our colliders. So right now these colliders are instances, which means they're not meshes. They're just points with some fancy metadata on them, telling Bifrost what meshes it would like to see on there. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hide that plane. We don't need to see that plane. That's just, just there to hold stuff. Really? And that's going to be that one. So the plane goes away. So now we've got just our rotating shapes. Perfect. But right now these are these are just points. So we do need to bake these instances. This will turn them back into meshes for us. Once we've done that, we can then set those animated rotors. And I can plug this in to show you. We'll just take the merge meshes out. Rewind. It's going to take a minute to bake, and there we go. Everybody's happy. We now don't need to see the points either, so they can go away, which is lovely. And that simply comes out of here and goes into the collider, just like that. So now we have a source, we have our collider, we have our standard surface material, and we can turn on our simulation engine here to see our sand. So let's Go back here and just take a look. Before we do that, let's turn off this use end frame so that it's just going to continually emit sand particles for us. And we'll play that now. Now that's pretty slow, so I'm going to try and speed that up a little bit. Let's take the particles per voxel down to 10, so half as many particles. And let's try playing that again real quick. Also, I think that our, our emission cube probably doesn't need to be seen anymore. And it's also just a bit wide. It's, it's, Quite a thick emission of sand there. So let's just go and fix that up as well. I'm just looking for a bit more speed. So we take a cube and let's take our width down to 0 0.25. Back to the beginning. That's probably going to be a bit better for us. We just need to also double check in the source that our resolution mode is set to relative. Our GOG T-shell size is driven off the solver, which is 0 0.15. So that should be cool. Let's see if that's sped it up any. Yes, quite a bit. And you can see as the sand particles come down, you can see the rotors colliding with them and turning them. And that's kind of the effect we're trying to get. So let's turn off our solver display and we'll output our material now. And I'm going to go away and play blast this for you. And then I will come back once I have something to show. And there you go. So that's behaving like sand. And that was pretty easy to set up. That was the first exercise. We're going to explain more of the settings and things as we get on to the second exercise. So. Let's move on to that now, but basically that is MPM sand, and then we'll stop that and move on to the next one. So let's keep things tidy. Sander one, that's cool. 
and we can hide it and it won't calculate anymore. So let's move on to the second one. So I'm going to need a new Bifrost graph, like so. Give that, we'll give that a name, call it Sando2, like that. And of course we are going to need some geometry for this as well. So let's get that imported now. That would be rake and rake geo. So we'll take rake first. This is just our little rake. We're combing the sand and we'll import the other stuff too. There we go. So there's our sand geometry and there's our container. So let's hide all those until we need them. And we're going to be doing the same thing. Before we do anything else, basic basic npm sand graph and explode because it's always good to go from scratch. Got the same thing doing what we do. So we need first off we need a geometry for the sand. So that's going to be what we import. So let's import those files now. Break geo is the file we want. And that gives us the container and the sand. So let's hide those. Obviously the sand geo comes in and gets plugged into the source because that's the source of our sand. All good. Then our container is going to come in as well and it's going to go into our collider. So basically we're going to be generating sand off the geometry and then it's going to sit inside of our collider. Let, let's take a look at what that's doing and just for fun, well just to make sure we can see, let's output the container to a terminal, let's check our settings, start frame one, end frame one, yep, so it's just going to emit one frame of sand in here, let's play that and see what happens. Okay, so obviously we don't have enough sand at all. And uh, so we need to change that. We need to either go into our NPM sand here and change our particles per voxel. At the moment it's eight. Let's rewind that. Let's set that up to something like 24. So three times the size. It's looking a bit better. Maybe we should go even further to 48. Now the particle display scale is very large, it's a 1. Let's change that down to 0 0.1 and we'll get a bit better idea there. There we go. And if you really want to check it out, you can always just put the granular particles out to out to a terminal and you'll see that they are very, very small. So let's quickly go back and play that again, see what happens. So the sand's going to settle a little bit. And then we're good. So I'm going to take that out and I'm going to turn that back on just to give myself a better idea. So I made some really quick adjustments. What I've done is actually gone up to 60 particles per voxel. And set our detail size on the solver down to 0.07. So right now it's just generating in the container and the container is colliding with it. That's all it's doing. It's not doing terribly much else other than that. So what we're trying to do is to get the rake to rotate and drag through the sand. So we're going to get the rake in, which is another import, which is this time is the rake.ma. There it is. And you can see it's already in, in a good starting position with its teeth uh, already inside the sand there. So let's bring, hide him and we'll bring him in here and we're going to need to pop this guy out to that terminal as well. So what I'm going to need to do is the same kind of rotation I did on the, uh, the first sand example with the little rotors, but this time I am going to use transform points. What I'd like to see is this rake go around in a circle like this. I will very quickly get that done now and speed it up so you don't have to sit through it again. And there we go. 
so we can have a quick look at that. I'm just going to turn off the NPM for now so it doesn't slow us down. We can just have a look to see the motion of the rake. And that's precisely what I want it to do. It waits, some more frames in there. It waits 10 frames to start and then it just starts to rotate around the Y axis there. Just like that, perfect. Okay, let's be safe and save this. That'll keep us safe then. And so what we're trying to do now, because we've got the, the rake needs to be plugged into the collider as well. So let's shuffle all of our NPM stuff along, which is cool. And we just take this and plug this into the collider too. And before we, uh, before we pause and press play so we can see what's going on, pause, you know, do a play blast, press play and see what we can go on. Go on. Let's take a look at some of the sand properties which sit in the source. I told you we'd get back to the properties. So the first thing we want to look at is the mass density. The mass density is, check the info node, always check the info node, the amount of mass in kilograms per cubic meter. Larger values make the sand heavier and allow it to push around lighter materials. I'm just going to double that. I'm going to go to 500. So it's quite heavy sand. The next thing we want to talk about is volume preservation, and that is the degree to which the sand preserves its volume versus its shape. So when that's set to zero, there's no volume preservation. Highest resistance against shape change. So it'll it'll try to stay the same shape as much as possible. When that's set to one, and it's only a zero to one property, when it's set to one, it behaves like a liquid. There's almost n like there's no shape preservation at all. It doesn't try to keep its shape. Then of course you've got friction and cohesion. Friction is what it sounds like, how much the sand resists sliding against itself for a given amount of compression. Let's pop that up to one, see what that does. And then cohesion is simply how much the sand tends to stick together. So when that value is zero, it's, it's completely dry, powdery sand. Anything higher than that, the sand starts to clump more and more and more and more. So let's put that up to one as well. And I will turn my NPM back on like so. I'm going to give it a save and then I will pause the video and come back with something for you guys to look at. So here you can get some idea of the rake running through the sand. This takes a fairly long time to simulate as it's quite high res. But there are examples in the PowerPoint, which I'm going to show you now. So if you take a look at this slide, this is showing you some rendered examples of the difference between friction and cohesion. Now you can play with the settings yourself. These are the what you're going to get with these settings. So friction zero point, quite low friction, quite low cohesion. It's a very messy. High friction and low cohesion. It's it's keeping its shape a bit better. Friction and cohesion the same. You can see that it's all very much sticking together. And then when you push the cohesion right up, it's literally just digging holes in the sand there. So that's how all of that works. As with everything, uh, play around with it on a lower res, maybe try some rendering to see what it looks like and come up with your own goodness. But that's pretty much all we're going to cover on NPM Sand. There are a bunch more settings in here, mostly to do with the solver and they're very, very similar to all of the other simulation stuff that we've been doing over the last couple of weeks. So you've got NPM Solver Globals is really only the new thing and that lets you to set the detail size for the entire system because you can switch this to solve a detail size here. We can take a look at the info node for some of this. Detect discontinuity, duplicates voxels near near small gaps or splits in the material to allow for discontinuous motion. So if you've got a hole in it, it's going to try and fill that for you. Link collider detail, ignores the detail size set for colliders and uses the solver detail size as set above. So that's just using this detail size for your colliders as well as for your sand itself. Cloth and shell, we won't need to worry about just now. Gravity, you know about. Accuracy, that's also in the other solvers. So the time step, basically how many times it simulates per frame. Minimum steps, maximum steps. Then you've got your point display, sort of some advanced stuff about voxel movement. You can freeze the voxels and things like that. And you can try a couple of times before it falls over. <laughs> then you've just got diagnostic properties. You can show the volume of the NPM if you wanted to see it and things like that. 
Colliders are the same no matter where you go, pretty much. They're either meshes or volumes and they have their properties. And then your NPM sand source is all about your particle settings, which we went through, your geometry volume conversion, so converting the things you plug into here into volumes to distribute your sand onto, and then the sand properties, which we just went through here. All of this, again, is in the info node. I encourage you to just take a look, have a read, and play with it. So that's pretty much sand. We're going to go on to its colder cousin now, which is NPM snow.